is on One Nation Under God, and actually it's part one. I agonized over this sermon more than I have in one in a long, long time. And then uh, God kind of whispered to me that it's probably going to be a part two and part three, Chuck. I said, come on. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. It's Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We come to you again. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and give us vision. You came to restore spiritual sight to the blind, to help us see truth and expose sin and to bring healing to that sin. We love you and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You know, I never ever, God's made it very clear to me, that no pastor should ever stand at a pulpit and say, you need to vote for this political party or this one. That shouldn't come from the pulpit. And some people feel like we shouldn't even talk about election whatsoever. And I don't believe that that's true. People say sometimes, well, that's in God's hands. He'll take care of that. Well, you know what? So is our marriage. God can do what He wants with our marriage, but He wants to teach us and equip us and to help us with our marriage and to bear down on it and to work with a commitment to make it better. Same with our health. God knows how long we're going to live, but this is our temple. This is where the Holy Spirit's living, so we're supposed to take care of ourselves. I heard this little story. This elderly couple, both of them passed away on the same day. They go up to heaven. They're up there checking in. Peter's showing them around the pearly gates and streets of gold and the mansion that they're going to live in, all of that. And his wife says, Leroy, have you ever seen anything so awesome? It's just wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. He says, yeah, it is something, he said. But you know what? If you wouldn't have had us on that not-so-diet and exercise program for so many years down there, we could have probably been here 25, 30 years sooner. We take care of ourselves. God wants us to take care of our country. He wants us to know truth. Israel, many times God went over and over, and here's how you're supposed to live. Here's how you could live, but here's how I want you to live. And I want you to remain true to God. It's an awesome responsibility to be able to know what kind of country we're going to leave to our children. And it's a pastor's job to educate and equip members to think biblically, to have a vision. I believe it with all of my heart. One of the questions I asked God, but Lord, this is Pastor Appreciation Month. I ain't going to appreciate me too much preaching on this. God said, it ain't about you being appreciated. It's about me being glorified and loving this country and wanting best. I want to be able to hold my grandchildren's hand and walk safely down the streets of this country. And I want those children to be able to hold their children's hand to walk safely down the streets of this country. But even more than that, I want them while they're holding their hand and walking to be able to say how great our God is and to treat Him right and to love Him. It should be the burden of our heart. In Billy Graham, the October session of his magazine, Decision, and I wanted to get it. I have a copy of it here. It says, two visions for America. Two visions for America. And there are two visions for America. Billy Graham was the founder. He went home to be with the Lord in 2018. The editor-in-chief now is Franklin Graham. And the executive editor is Jim Daly. Focus on the family. The head of Focus on Family. They talked in this magazine about what's at stake in this election. And they give an in-depth analysis of the candidates, the parties, the issues, the important uh, that we that we follow uh, what's going on in our country and the dangers that are posed to strike at the heart of the religious liberties. He said, it's an in-depth analysis of the candidates, the parties, and the issues important to follow as Christ as we face the most critical election of our lifetime. And in that magazine, and you'll be able to see a website where you'll be able to get it I had read a call. I wanted to get a bunch of copies of the magazine. I couldn't do it. But we can give the website here in a minute where you can get on there. And it explains. It doesn't tell you to vote for this party or another. It just tells you what is the roles of the government 
or what religious liberty is, family, abortion, marriage, courts, on down the line, and it stands. I believe we're to look at that. Sixty-eight years ago, in 1952, at the age of 34, Billy Graham said this, I think it is the duty of every individual Christian in election time to study the issues, study the candidates, then go to the polls and vote. At the bottom there, at decisionmagazine.com, is where you'll see that decision magazine. You can get on there and see everything that's written there. I just beg you and pray that you'll look at that and, and read that. But it's the duty. You know, many, many Christians don't vote. I didn't vote for a long time. I didn't even turn the TV on and know what the issues were to vote. It wasn't important to me. It should be important to us. Many Christians vote, and I don't believe that they really come to God. And we're going to look today at how do we come to God and ask for your will. Now, what I do have, and you can get afterwards with these verses, is the Family Research Council, the party platform comparison. It shows side by side the issues of sanctity of human life, redefining marriage, everything from abortion, health care, and you can read for yourself. And we have those at the front and the back. You can take as many copies of those as you want. Study the issues. Study the candidate. And then vote after you've prayed. Now, as I've looked, we all know the parable, and we're not going to go into the whole parable of the wheat and tares. Remember that parable? God said that the wheat was sown by Jesus. And the wheat sprouted up, and that was the ones that became, that listened to the gospel and became Christians. The field, he said, was the world where we live. The tares, he said, was sown by Satan. The enemy lies that Satan gives. Now, as I began to think about that, and, and even when I preached on the parables of Jesus, I missed this one little part. How was Satan able to sneak those tares in in front of God's people? Well, Jesus said in Matthew thirteen twenty five, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. While his men, who's his men? That's us Christians. That's God's men. God's people, God's family. It doesn't mean that it was nighttime that they were in bed taking a nap. It means that they were not on guard and alert and aware of what was happening. And the enemy came in and sowed it while they were sleeping. God wants us to be awake. He wants us to be alert. He wants us to understand that Satan, the reason Satan was able to do this, he disguises himself, the Bible says, as an angel of light. You can't even see it happening. Only through wisdom are we able to be able to pick out what's going on in our country and around our world. And wisdom, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 7, the beginning of it is choir wisdom. And with all of your acquiring, get understanding. So the beginning of it is, I need it. I need it. i got to acquire it. And one, to get understanding means, why is it necessary? Why would I want it? God wants you to understand why he wants to give it to you. He don't want to just force it on you. He'll never force any gift on us. I want to come to you, God. I haven't got everything figured out. And I want to know and I want to understand what you want to tell me. I want to know right from wrong. I want to know the difference between false teaching and correct teaching. Isaiah 5.21 says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. For years... I was wise in my own eyes. My dad used to tell me, when I try to tell you something, it goes in one ear and out the other. I was pretty well convinced that's because there wasn't anything in between them. I used to watch the three students. They'd run a pipe cleaner in and pull it out the other ear. But that must be me. I wasn't listening. I figured I knew everything. If woe means, when God says woe, that means not good. It also means, when we say woe to a horse, that means stop. Stop. I want to teach you something. God wants to teach us. As I prepared this for this sermon, there was four words that God kept bringing to me, and I thought, I don't know how that started. I don't know. I can't talk about that. I don't know. He said, well, learn. I said, but it's not going to go over good, especially not on the Internet. And then four words, we are going to talk about them this morning. 
We hear them on the news all the time. And those four words are liberalism, to be liberal or conservative, or to be right or left. And I'm not going to tell you which is which. God wants to help you with that. Those words are not new. That's nothing new. Liberal and conservative, if you look into the dictionary, I'm going to tell you what the dictionary says, not what Charlie says. In 1820, 100, 200 years ago, 200 years ago in the Library of Congress, the definition was given of liberal. Let me tell you what it is. Not strict in observance of orthodox ways. Orthodox meaning established doctrine. Are lacking moral restraint. Conservative, a cautious or discreet person who adheres to traditional or established doctrine views. We can look at issues in front of us that are coming down in our country, abortion, and we're going to look at the right and left thing a little later, the definitions of them. There's a biblical definition of that. Abortion and marriage. There's a confusion in our country of what it even means anymore to be male or female. God wants to help us understand it. It's a baseline responsibility of every government to protect human life and little babies that are in the womb. Moses said when the people were coming into the promised land, he said, stop. I'm not going to get to go in, but I want to tell you something to those of you that are going in. We're not to do any longer what we've been doing. Everybody but doing what's right in his own eyes. Both parties need to have their eyes open and restored sight to their mind. And biblical guidance is the only thing that leads us into truth. It said, woe, woe to those who are clever in their own sight. And you know what that means? That means somebody that looks at it and says, I don't need to acquire godly wisdom. I don't need it. I'm just fine. I got this all figured out. That's how I was for a long time. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19, Let no one deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he's wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. He says no man or woman should deceive himself. We're all foolish before God, and that we are thinking worldly. Once we become a Christian, God wants us to come to Him. He wants us to be able to teach His truth. He wants to give us the right thinking. In Jeremiah 9, 23-24, we see God talking to the people. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the, rich, the mighty man boast of his might, and let not a rich man boast of his riches, let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who executes and ex exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. To be able to come to God and know and understand His heart. For Him to be able to show us truth of right and wrong. Not what I think. What do you think? Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. We can figure this out as we walk, and that's why God's Word is the only moral compass for us. It's the only thing that brings us into truth, and God looks into our hearts. The heart. What am I after? What do I want to think? What do I want to know, and why do I want to know truth? God examines the heart, and am I going to come to you, and am I going to obey you once I begin to hear truth? David had messed up so much. He had committed adultery. He had committed murder. And he finally had clarity and was forgiven. And God said about him, I found David a man after my own heart. He wasn't talking about I like him more than the other guys in town. He was talking about David had finally realized my heart doesn't have what it takes. I'm becoming a man after your heart. I want your heart. I want you to guide me. You're the one that's full of love and you're the one that's full of truth. And I want to know godly wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 26, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Who we trust in him? You know, there's a reason. The verse that we just had back there that said about us boasting that we shouldn't even boast in our riches, that we shouldn't even boast in our riches, 
Why do you think it is, whose idea was it in this country and only in this country to ever put on our currency in God we trust? Because it is easy to get caught up in the trust in, in our riches. There is no way that riches can forgive your sins. It's in God we trust. God leads us into repentance. God helps us know, I've paid the price through my son's blood. He wants us to know truth. It's in God that we trust and not in our own heart. Now, I I gave you the definition, not mine, of conservative and liberal. I came out of Webster's. You can go look at it yourself. And that was 200 years ago that that was put in the Library of Congress. Right and left, I thought, there ain't no way I'll figure something out with that. I began to pray about it. 3,000 years ago, over 3,000 years ago, not 200 years ago, over 3,000 years ago, God, through the Bible, gave the answer to that. In the ancient world, back in Solomon's time, Right from left meant the difference between right and wrong are good and evil. You say, well, how do you know that, Charlie? Listen to what Solomon said about it. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 2. Not my words. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. I didn't write the book. It's God's word. It's the same thing when people want to argue with me about marriage. God defined marriage. I didn't. God defined it. God defined adultery, not me. And since 1973, I want us to see this. Because when we think about it, well, I really can't tell which which party's right. One factor I want us to talk about, and it's abortion. Since 1973, the decision for Roe versus Wade 61 million babies' lives have been taken. 61 million. That should tell us something. Those little children, they can't fend for themselves. Who's going to protect them? If Christians don't, it ought to be obvious to us what to do there and what, what the right thing is to do. How do we know right from wrong? I did not research this. I know Abraham Lincoln's been dead a long time. But the Bible is our moral compass. This is in the Bible. You can look in your Bible. You can see it. Billy Graham, or I mean Abraham Lincoln, a long time ago when he was living, he said this, The Bible is the best gift God's given to men. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we couldn't know right from wrong. You can turn the television on all you want. And both sides add confusion. You're only going to get truth from God's Word. It is the moral compass. It is the only place that we find truth. He knew that a long time ago. I believe he was one of the best presidents we ever had. So we come to God. I want this thing. I know you want me to vote. I need wisdom. I've had my heels dug in on this side or this side. I want to come to you and I want to know wisdom. Listen to what James said about it. James 1, 5 through 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously. He wants to give it to us and without reproach. That doesn't mean, hey, you've messed up. Reproach means I'm not going to sit there and address you down for your past mistakes. I want to give you wisdom. But he must act and ask in faith. Without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. He wants to give us wisdom. He won't force wisdom. He won't force salvation. He will not force you to come to heaven. But he wants to give us wisdom. I always thought when I saw this verse, and I missed this part about wisdom, that it was talking about healing somebody. I have prayed for people that's had cancer. I have prayed for people that even have been crippled. Because I see the stories in the Bible about how people have been rejuvenated, and I, and I want to be able to do that. But there's a doubt in the back of my mind whether they're going to get better. It's not talking about that. It's talking about, without any doubting, what are you going to do with it when you get it? 
Is there a doubt? Well, I doubt if I'll use it. Or I doubt if I'll even take it from you. I'm doubting whether I'm really going to sincerely do anything with it. God wants us to come to Him in faith. Lord, help me once you begin to tell me the truth to use it. We had the missionaries here Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. Two of them that were here, their names is Odie and Cheryl. And those missionaries hadn't been married too long. They had two little children, and God moved them into China. Intense persecution. And Cheryl went into town. And there was a little Chinese boy there. And she felt God pulling at her heart, you need to adopt this little boy. She went home, all excited, and told Odie, your husband, we need to adopt this little Chinese boy. He said, are you crazy? Are you losing your mind? We're just over here, just moved our family here, can't hardly support them. We've got two little children. We're being persecuted. We could lose our lives there. Who told you and gave you such a crazy idea? She said, God did. They fell to their knees, began to pray. They adopted that little boy. God wants to give us truth, but we've got to be able to realize we need to do something with it. When we vote, focus on the policies and the issues rather than the personality and the politics. Focus on the policies and the issues. It said when we doubt, we're like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Instead of wind, you could insert media. You cannot go by how you're going to vote by what you see on here on television. The media is biased towards the worldview. They have been for a long time. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate all Christians. Because he has the answer and the solution to sin. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do his commandments. Now, we just had a verse that said the beginning of wisdom is to acquire it. God's not speaking out of both corners of his mouth here. He wants us to know we've got to be smart enough to know we need wisdom. And when I come to the Lord, the beginning of it is I'm going to respect what you asked me to do. My mom and dad used to tell me things to do. I didn't want to obey them. I didn't want to have a reverence for them. We obey God. It's in God we trust, and we call him our Lord. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We want to seek Him. We want to know Him. We want to obey His will. We want to hold our children as we walk down the streets and say, You know what? One of these days we get to go to heaven. And it's because of a cross. And God loves us. And we want to treat our God right. And the only way that we know how to learn how to do that is through the pages of this Bible. And yes, it requires change for us, but it's always for our good and for the best. He loves us. Blessed is the nation. I always get confused at what blessed means and what is the blessing. When I think about God blessing me, what does that mean that I'm going to get rich, God? Does that mean the car ain't going to break? That tree that I just planted, is it going to really look pretty be super nice? And I'm going to catch a bunch of fish today if I go fishing. What is the blessing? It's the blessing of salvation. And God wants us to take that message. It's why Satan hates this country so much, because our forefathers, when they pulled up to the shores of this country, they wanted a different life for their children. They wanted a life in this country to be founded on the Word of God and the truth of God's Word. To know God's not just the God that tells you not to lie and steal. He wants you to know why He doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to know why He doesn't want you to commit adultery. He wants you to know why He has put the things, because He loves us. And the nation, whose God is the Lord, remember Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. We're to do something with the blessing. And when Jesus was ready to go into heaven, He said this, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We all know this. It's called the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. If the, if the Lord's the Lord of this nation, we're to take it to the other nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
Teach him to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The commission. You want to know why Satan hates this country so much? Because we're a threat to him. Because we know the truth. We have the gospel. There's a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming. Now, this next verse that I put up here, I want to explain it before you jump to a conclusion. It is at the judgment. And the Bible says in Matthew 25, 32 through 33, Jesus said, all the nations, every nation, not just the United States, will be gathered before him. And he'll separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. People look at that sometimes and say, well, we know which part political party is on the left and which party is going to heaven. It's not what it's saying at all. Let me tell you something. When we get to the judgment, there will be many people that were on the right politically on this earth that are going to find themselves in the left lane of judgment. Pretty good people, but not trusting in Christ. We trust in Christ. He's the only one that can forgive our sins. That's the blessing that we take to the other nations, that He is our Savior and He is our Lord. Jesus said, many will say, Lord, Lord. I was in this party. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. We trust in Christ's blood that washes us from our sins. We look back at the cross when we come out of the judgment now and we go to the day Jesus was crucified. I want us to look at the cross. The Bible tells us in Matthew 27, 38, at that time, two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. It's a picture of everybody that's ever lived. Now, I thought for a long time, I was just sure that the one on the right was the one that accepted Christ, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, and the other one rejected it. You search your Bible. Nowhere does it say which is which. It does not say it. And there's a reason for that. In the movies, you'll see the one that accepted him always on the right. That's the movies. The Bible tells us in Matthew 27, 44, a few verses later, the robbers who had been crucified with Jesus were insulting Jesus with the same word. Both of them. You know what that insult was? Both robbers, not one worse than another. It wasn't like one stole more money than the other one. They were insulting him with, you know what? You've been talking about being a Savior. And if you can really do that, and your Heavenly Father, who you talk so much about, if He cares anything about you, then He ought to be saving you. If He really loves you, He ought to be saving you. Both robbers were insulting Him with that. There's lost people in both political parties. The only hope for America and for the world is Jesus Christ. There was no favoritism at the cross. Both sinners were deserving hell. It was Christ offering salvation to a lost world. I used to watch a show that I kind of liked. I think Tom Cruise remade it. It was called Mission Impossible. It was a pretty cool show. Some of you may have seen it. I want to talk to you. We're going to close with something today. That Jesus was talking to the people, his disciples especially. Many of the scribes and Pharisees were there that just thought they were a shoe in to go to heaven. They didn't need Jesus. He began to explain to them about the kingdom of heaven. And he, he looked over, and there was some rich people there, and he said, it's easier for a camel to go through a little eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Now, many people have kind of looked down on rich people for that. He wasn't talking about that at all. It's fine to be rich. God wants you to use your riches to help other people. The point was, rich people can help themselves to many things on this earth, but they can't pay for price for their sin. Even rich people can't buy their way to heaven. Matter of fact, if you yourself had every penny on this earth in a stack, and you'd only sinned once through the whole course of your life, you couldn't pay for that one sin. Well, they looked at Jesus when he said that, that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They threw up their hands. They said, well, who can be saved? Who can be saved? 
And Jesus' answer was, well, with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Now, what's our country's number one mission? It's not to win a political party. It's to share the gospel. And when we go to other nations, other people, whether it's your neighbor across the street, what's your message? Many people ask me many times, what are you supposed to say? What are we supposed to say? Our closing verse today is something that the Apostle John wrote about John the Baptist. And he sees Jesus coming, and he says this in John 1.29. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus come to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, I want you to see what I found. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Savior. He's the only one that can take away the sin of the world. You know why Satan hates this country so much and why he's bearing down on it? It's because we have the light. We know the truth. And there's a battleground for right and wrong. God wants you to know truth and he wants us to be able to understand what our primary mission is. Jack talked about it in Sunday school. Now some people after this election, you know, it's all sorted out. One side's going to win or the other. Some people are going to sink in depression after this election. You know what God wants us to know? I'm always with you, even to the end of the age. I am always with you, even to the end of the age. I want you to know the number one mission is still the same. Our opening verse was, where there is no vision, the people perish. Don't lose sight of the mission that's been given to us as Christians. It's to go and share the gospel. And yes, we want to vote. And yes, we want a good country for our children to grow up in. And we want to love our God through the process because we get to go to heaven because of Him. I learned something from two missionaries a different night. I think maybe it was Tuesday night. Their name was Dan and Christy. And they were in missionaries in a Muslim country. Intense persecution. And as they began to share different Muslims' testimonies that came to Christ, they said some of them was because we gave them a coat because they were cold, and some of them was because we gave them a cup of water. Things that Jesus told us to do, we had a kind word. But they said, you know something that God's taught us to do? To be able to pray. People tell me sometimes, I don't know how to pray for the laws. They don't know how to pray for the laws. They began to pray over there that God would reveal Jesus in the Muslims' dreams. And they said when all of the Muslims that are coming to Christ, when they share how it happened, and some are through the cup of cold water and some are through the, the coat that they gave them, but the majority of them, they, they found Jesus in their dreams. They began dreaming at night and they began to see him. And I thought, I've never prayed that. I've never thought of praying that. I've never thought of praying for our officials in our government that they would meet Jesus that way. It's an intense thing. It just moved my heart. Our mission is to make disciples, to proclaim Christ, to glorify Him in this country. And Father, we are thankful for Your mercy. And God, these things that break Your heart in our country, this abortion, and how marriage and the family is being ripped apart. God, help us to know the right thing to do and help us, God, to have your word open. And we are so thankful that you said when you went to heaven that you'd send your Holy Spirit to help us know truth. God, we pray for this country that our leaders would have an encounter with you, Jesus, whether it be in a dream or whether it be someone sharing the gospel to them. That they would know truth. And Father, help us to see we're all part of this. Let us never take for granted the price that our founding fathers paid to be able to give us these freedoms and to protect our religion. 
And we love you, Jesus, and we thank you. Help us, Father, to share the gospel. And help us, abortion, to stop. We are sorry, God. We're sorry for the things we've done in this country. We want to love you. We want to praise you. We come to you today for wisdom and direction. And help us, God, to forgive even our enemies. And to love like you love us. And to never compromise truth. And to understand you're the Lamb of God. And you came to take away our sins and to forgive us and to help us live a life, an abundant life. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. 